Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, is everyone having a, a good time so far at CSGA 2016? Um, I'd like to, at this point to share something about one of our partners that CSGA started working with over the past year, the Infosys Foundation USA. Uh, like all of us here, uh, the foundation is passionate about supporting computer science for all. Since 2015, the foundation has been helping children, young adults, and educators become creators of technology and places special emphasis on helping those in historically underrepresented communities. The foundation's three initiatives, I'm sorry, the foundation's initiatives cover three areas. Teacher training and support, where they partner with organizations like CSTA, Code.org, NSF, DonorsChoose.org, Bootstrap, ECS, and many more. Student learning opportunities, supporting hands-on learning and computer science, coding, and making. And thought leadership, bringing together like-minded computer science advocates at crossroads to explore ideas and recognizing makers through uh, Infi Makers, uh, the Infi Maker Awards and uh, Why I Make campaign. And so at this point, I'm, I'm very delighted to introduce to you our final CSGA uh, keynote speaker, Vandana Sikha. Vana serves as the chairperson of the Infosys Foundation USA. She also has an undergraduate and a master's in computer science. She's a board member of Code.org, is head of a tech startup, and a full-time mom to two boys. Her passion is to make computing education more widely and easily accessible because she believes that education is, the, is a great equalizer to help bridge inequality develop the skill sets needed for the future, and open up new opportunities. We are so delighted to have Vandana here today. So please join me in welcoming her. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark, for the lovely introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is truly a privilege and an honor to be here amongst all of you. All of you, the amazing people who shoulder the responsibility of empowering our students with the skills they need to create an awesome future, a very digital future, and to thrive in it. I'm here today, as Mark said, not just as a representative of Infosys Foundation USA, which is deeply committed and invested to the CS for All movement, but I'm here today also as the daughter of a teacher. I grew up appreciating the significant role that teachers play in shaping our society, in the lives of our students, and in shaping the future. I'm here today also as a CS professional. I have studied computer science for six years. I have witnessed firsthand the positive impact that my CS education has had on my life, even though I studied it more than 20 years ago. I am from that thin band of women in technology, the band that we are all trying to expand. I have lived a Silicon Valley dream and I look forward to the day when we will see equal participation from women in technology and STEM jobs. But most importantly, I'm here today. What makes me more proud to be here today is as a mother. I have two boys, both in the public school system. I'm deeply committed to their education, as I am to the education of all children of the world. I want nothing more than for them to succeed in the future that I hope that they will create along with other children of the world. So how are we going to do this? I'm here to talk about this and offer you perhaps some new insights, some new perspectives into things that you might already know about. I will make five points. No big deal, just five points. My first point is to highlight what the word computer in computer science really means. The computer is our greatest invention. You know, I imagine all of you know that. And it is certainly our greatest amplifier. It is the ultimate machine. And yet, for some reason, we, we box ourselves into a very limited view of what a computer is. And to help make my first point, I want to play a video by a living legend, a pioneer in computing, Turing Award winner, Alan Kay. I asked Alan to describe what a computer really is, because some people seem to think that it is just a box of tin and plastic with a keyboard and a screen. So if you can please play the first video. <laughs> In fact, we definitely want to think beyond laptops, tablets, and smartphones. 
Because most people use them just as conveniences for various kinds of media, like automating the post office, the telephone, automating uh, rec mu music recording, videos, and everything else, and almost never for what computers can really do, all they ever see is the manifestation of computers. They don't see computers themselves. And in fact, focusing on the box is a bit of a mistake because the music is not in the piano. The music is actually in Sam, and music is about singing inside, even if you're playing. And so computers are music instruments whose music is ideas, then we have to help people learn idea music and to learn to sing ideas inside. And people have been doing this for a long time. We're all aware of the abacus, and it goes back not just to the Middle Ages, but it also goes back to Roman times. Those little uh, pebbles there are called calculi. Guess what the, What you did with it was called? Uh, the Greeks had it also, and so even though their way of writing numbers was not so good, they computed in a way that showed that they did understand what the, the number zero was good for. And here's the Antikythera, which is a computing device uh, also from that period uh, that computes the movements of the planets, of the moon, even calculates the Olympiads, and the reconstructions of it are quite beautiful. At a school a few years ago, uh, some fourth grade children were upset that the sprinklers would often go on when it was raining. This became a class project, and here's one of the best solutions that they came up with. See here, the, there's a plunger on a spring, and the spring pushes it up, and the sprinkler can go. But if there's a lot of water in there, it pushes the plunger down. It blocks the flow of the sprinkler. And you can see this is a kind of a logic gate that this water here but no water here will give you water here but water here and water here will give you no water here and here's what the uh, child who thought this up looks like Jamaica age 10 in fourth grade her mother just told me that she's now at JPL and you can make the same kind of deciding and doing machines out of ropes so see if we pull on this rope, it'll pull it. If we pull on this rope, it'll pull it. If we pull on both of it, then it will pull it. So this is the OR function. But here if we pull on one, it will slide on the pulley. So we have to pull on both. So that's the AND function. And here if we pull on it, it goes in the other direction. So that's an inverter. And we can make circuits out of it. These ropes, here's one that um, does uh, part of addition. We can do the same thing with Tinker Toys. Here we can see that a push with this will move it, a push with this will move it, a push with both will move it. So that's also an OR, but done in Tinker Toys. Push it this way, it goes the other direction. So that's an inverter. We can make things out of that. And here's a whole Tinker Toy computer made by Danny Hillis and Brian Silverman many years ago that's now in the Computer History Museum. And one of the things that computing is really important for is to make and give us things that will help us to think better. That's what we need to do. So Alan has such a unique perspective on things, and I love the way he is able to articulate such things so beautifully. I love this definition, computer as an idea machine. So thanks, Alan. So to reiterate Alan's point, here is what computers have basically looked like for decades, a box of tin and plastic, basically with a screen and a keyboard. But as Alan said, it is not the only form or shape that a computer can exist in. Here is what Danny Hillis, another pioneer of computing, has said about computers. Let me give you a few seconds to read that. So he said, a computer is a device that accelerates and extends our processes of thought. It is an imagination machine that can become almost anything that we can imagine. And this is the Antikythera mechanism. Alan also mentioned this in his video. This is one of the earliest mechanical manifestations of a computer. And recently, they also discovered that this was, in fact, a living textbook. And that was more than 2,000 years ago. 
Here we see another early computer, and I imagine everyone here in this room is very familiar with this. The world's first computer program was written on this by Lady Ada Lovelace. Actually, let me say that again. The world's first computer program was written by a woman. And not only that, she actually invented the whole concept of programming. We should probably have her picture put in every computer lab, perhaps, just to make in the point around diversity. This is a memory core that was made out of rope, another mechanical implementation of a computer. And this was used by NASA in the 1960s and the 1970s. And by the way, this was also programmed by women. So what you saw were all mechanical implementations of a computer so far. The shape of a computer can also be anything that we can imagine. And kids, of course, have the best imagination. So what you see here are actually computers made by little children using Raspberry Pis. I think you guys had like a workshop on Raspberry Pi, and I think that must have been awesome for all of you to learn and to take back to your students. So what you see here is computers in the shape of a drone, in the shape of a solar smart meter, or a microwave oven, and many other implementations. And this, of course, needs no introduction. The earliest cell phones were phones with a little bit of digital technology. What you see here is not a phone. It is actually a computer in the shape of a phone. In fact, these phones are more powerful than the supercomputers that were around when I was studying CS 20 years ago. Thermostats, everyone knows those. We've seen those for decades. That is not a thermostat. That is a computer in the shape of a thermostat. Programmable, self-learning, sensor-driven, and Wi-Fi enabled. And by the way, you can see the processor that all these slides that I showed you, they have the processor information on each slide. Here we have a computer in the shape of a car. <laughs> we now have technology companies that are making cars. Who would have thought that? And we will very soon see more technology companies becoming car companies. So as you can see, a computer can take the shape of almost anything that we can imagine. Another important aspect of computing that is often overlooked, that we don't talk about that often, is that the price performance of computing has been improving dramatically, exponentially, for the last 50 years. And all this because of a prediction made by this one man, Gordon Moore, the founder of Intel. Back in 1965, I think that might have been seven years before I was born, he wrote a paper that predicted that the price performance of computing will double every two years. In one of the greatest engineering feats of humanity, engineers have kept this going for so long. In fact, they have done better than double every two years. What this means is that the smartphones today are more powerful than the supercomputers from 20 years ago, and this trend will continue beyond Moore's law as well. Our children who are in elementary school today will in the future work on computers that are 10 to 20 times more powerful, cheaper, and smaller. Computing in the large, here you see giant servers, massive cloud data systems. As performance improves, size becomes smaller, we have the ability to capture and process massive amounts of data. And hence, we have created these giant systems that now process all the world's data. It is estimated that the four to five of the largest, biggest tech companies in the world collectively spend more than $20 billion on infrastructure every year, purchasing more than 20 million servers every year. I hope that someone is paying attention to this problem of electronic waste, because one thing is for sure, in a few decades, we might be leaving behind a junkyard of all this stuff for our poor children to clean up. And at the other end of the spectrum, here you see the smallest computer in the world, the M3, the micro moat made by some researchers at the University of Michigan. It is a full working computer, and it is only one cubic millimeter in size. In the first picture, you see that little computer sitting on top of an American dime, just to give you a sense of its relative size. In the future, we can easily imagine that in a glass of beverage, we could be drinking many of these computers, consuming them, going inside our body, monitoring our body systems through another application or a device. So together, these massive cloud systems and tiny computers are powering the digital revolution. What you see in the last box, these are devices and apps that have become possible because of computing in the small. So an interesting point I want to make about the font that you see, 
The first font is actually a black letter font. It's one of the earliest fonts back in the 15th century when Gutenberg first invented the printing machine. He used this font. And the second font that you see is a more recent one made by a big tech company just a few years ago. So it's kind of a blending of the old and the new and the potential and how we can move forward in the future. My first point was that a computer is a very powerful machine and we can be, and it can be whatever we can imagine. And when we teach CS, we have to emphasize this point over and over again to our students to not limit our view of what a computer is, but rather what it can be. My second point is that the world around us is going through a digital transformation. 20 years ago, Nicholas Negroponte wrote a book called Being Digital, where he talked about the conversion of this world from a world of atoms to a world of bits. What you see here are many familiar artifacts that we all have grown up with. They have disappeared or are all disappearing. You see here projectors, wallets with cash, desktop calendar, newspapers, textbooks, telephones, CD players, floppy disks, the list is endless. All these physical things are disappearing, consumed by computing. Mark Anderson has famously said software is eating the world, and it will continue to do so, irrevocably and exponentially. And the result of software eating the world, folks, many huge companies that we grew up with have disappeared or are disappearing. Everyone here must have, at some point in their life, rented a video from Blockbuster or purchased a book from Borders. They are gone. And with that, at the same time, completely new technology companies have emerged in leadership positions in traditional industries. Amazon, a technology company, is now the leading global retailer and the fastest company in the world to get to $100 billion in sales. Tesla, another tech company, is now the leading car company. Airbnb is the largest hotel company in the world and has three times more the number of rooms than the second largest hotel company in the world, and all this without owning even a single room. And Apple, which was originally a computer company, sells phones and is also a watch company and may very soon become a car company as well. And there are many other digital companies that are transforming this world. So as computers become faster, cheaper, and smaller, we will continue to see the emergence of new devices and new applications driven by computing. Applications that will disrupt our existing processes, how we do things in every industry, in every walk of life. Sitting here in this context, it is very hard for us to imagine what the future will be like, especially when the pace of transformation is so dramatic. 10 to 15 years from now, the world our children will grow up in will be dramatically different and will definitely be driven by computing and software. Can you imagine how underprepared our children will be in this future if they have not received any education in technology, in software, or in computing? And this is precisely my third point. Our children are underprepared for this very digital future. So to emphasize this point, I want to play another video made by Infosys Foundation around the jobs of the future. So can you please play the second video? Children starting school this year won't be graduating college until 2033. And despite what we've been told, nobody has a clue what the world will look like in even five years. It's our contention that computer science is now as important as basic literacy. One of the primary reasons for educating our children is occupational preparation. But how are we to educate them for a future that's so unpredictable, so unknown? Traveling to the future, we will see jobs the likes of which we've never seen before. Jobs such as virtual reality architect, where the blending of video, computers, and augmented reality will all come together to create a new way of communicating. One thing we know for sure is that computer science will be one of the top skills workers of the future will need. Jobs such as urban agriculturalist could appear and help find better, more environmentally sustainable ways to harvest food in urban settings. It is projected that by the year 2020, 
there will be two million jobs that fall under computer science and engineering related fields. Today we're already seeing the creation of 3D printed organs, a blending of biology and computer science, allowing artificially created yet genetically perfect body parts printed in a lab. Computer science will impact every aspect of our future lives. Yet of the 42,000 high schools in the United States, just over 2,000 teach computer science. This is dismal. We know that students who are exposed to computer science at a young age are eight times more likely to major in computer science in college. Take transportation, for example. Imagine traveling from San Francisco to Los Angeles in 30 minutes inside a hypertube. Something like that would require a hypertube engineer, a job which would not exist without computer science. Let's give our children all the tools they need to build the future of their dreams. So this is a very interesting chart that we put together. If we look at our history, approximately 6% of the world's population could read and write in the Dark Ages. That roughly about 10% were literate in the, in the mid 19th century. Today, according to IDC, there are roughly 20 million professional programmers in the world, and that's about 0.3% of the world's population. Ladies and gentlemen, we can safely infer that our digital li literacy today is lower than the reading and writing literacy in the Dark Ages. CS education and CS teacher development is fundamental to our future, and that is the heart of this matter. Well, the good news is that the journey from bleak to bright has already begun. Students have spoken, and we have seen in a recent survey, some of you might have already seen this, that students enjoy computer science and the arts the most. And we thank you for making computer science so fun and engaging for our students. And of course, you have to wonder what it would be like if we merged computer science with the arts, or sciences, or math, or for all that matter, every other subject. In another Gallup survey that was done last year, nine out of 10 parents expressed a desire to have their children learn computer science. So we know that the parents want their children to learn computer science. Students want to learn. Let me share with you something that happened to me this morning. Just before I got on this flight to get here to San Diego, a package arrived, coincidentally, just today. It had a lot of notes inside. Out of curiosity, I opened it. There was a box full of these thank you notes that came from children. Because of a grant that we had done to a school in Michigan, children made these cards, and so did the teachers, thanking us for the grant because we made it possible for them to try out projects in computing. These, to me, are not letters of gratitude. These, to me, tell me that the students want to learn, the teachers want to teach computer science. So we have here everybody lining up together with the same goal, with the same desire. We need to make sure that policy is on board. We need to make sure that we have the right funding for computer science, public funding, private funding, funding from companies, the big technology companies who are benefiting the most from this dig digital revolution. We need to make sure everybody is on board. As students, As students, parents, and community members express more and more interest in computer science education, we are seeing that more and more schools, school districts, cities, states are adopting computer science. But we still have a long way to go. Globally, we are seeing countries make computer science education for their students a national priority. The United States is not on this list yet. As we accelerate the pace of CS education adoption, we need to do more and do better. We need to rethink the what and the how of teaching computer science. I don't have all the answers. I'm not an expert. So I will only share some ideas on this note, on this point number four, and hope that they will be starting points for you to ponder over as you leave this great gathering of amazing minds. We must not, we cannot wait another 1,500 years to get to the point where the majority of the planet understands this new digital literacy. 
So here are some ideas that we put together on bridging the what, what to teach in computer science. And you, of course, have a lot of experience in this. Many efforts are also underway. Let kids learn by giving them access to real systems, solving real problems that they relate to, and providing real data to work on in the context that they understand this. We also need to teach them the underlying concepts of computer science, not just blind coding. And finally, we need to be able to transcend individual languages and transient tools. This third one is a very important point, and I have another slide to make that point. What you see here are the programming language adoption rates over time. Actually, how programming languages evolved over time. We started with uh, machine-driven languages. You might recognize a lot of these early languages, Fortran, uh, Basic, Pascal, C++, you know. And then the evolution of these languages continues. Uh, the important point is languages come and go. New languages will come and go, and we cannot get our kids to identify themselves with a single language or just one or two languages. Languages will be written over and over again. They will become popular. But we have to make sure that we teach our children the fundamentals so they are able to learn any language at any given point of time. And here we are going to talk about bridging the house. To bridge this big gap in computer science education, we also need to think about the new house, how to teach computer science. And again, there are some amazing people who are doing some compelling work. Some of this work is also funded by the NSF. As many of you know, the best teaching is when it is experiential, when it is immersive, when all or many of our senses are engaged, when we are immersed in the world that we are learning about. There is a famous saying that to learn French, you should go to France. So let us teach computer science by emphasizing project-based, real-world problem solving. And learning should also be immediate and responsive. This means not having to write code in one tool and then compiling, building, and running it in a different code. We all know how inefficient that is, how painful and frustrating that can be. And imagine doing that to our students. That is not going to be fun and engaging. So we definitely need to have new dev tools that provide us immediate feedback. And again, there are some promising efforts. Scratch is a great example of that. And more recently, Brett Victor's recent work on live coding is another example. And there are many other efforts underway as well. Learning should also be iterative. Kids learn best when they are allowed to or almost encouraged to make mistakes, to try rapid iterations, and just to see what happens. We all learn from mistakes. We get better. There is this thin zone between classwork that is too challenging and gets children anxious and classwork that is, that is too non-engaging or boring. We have to teach within this certain band. Well, the three eyes, immersive, immediate, and iterative. I didn't plan for it that way, but it ended up that way, so I think it's kind of cool. There are many other ways that we can uh, engage more students into computer science. Hackathons, collaborative coding, maker spaces, fairs, competitions, and I'm sure from your own experiences, you guys could come up with an even greater list of how to teach computer science. And CSTA, by the way, is a great, great platform to be sharing all the what's in the house for everyone to learn from, for, for everyone to get on board and you know, share each other's knowledge. So now let us hear a student's, student's point of view on how they learn best and what their favorite um, learning experiences are. Can you play the third video? I like doing the science where we were learning about animal adaptation. I was uh, partners with someone and we picked the woolly mammoth. We had, we had to go on the iPad and then like search it up. Oh, I would say the gold rush because we really got to do a ton of hands-on learning. We did a lot of building stuff and reading and getting to learn by ourselves, not just being fed all of the information. English honors. So that class was a lot of, uh, included a lot of Socratic seminars. So we discussed a lot, gave out our ideas, and our essays were really, you know, personal. The questions she asked were really interesting, like they made you think. And that's what I like. I really like discussing and sharing my ideas. But I like seeing other perspectives on things, not just my perspective. So it gives me an open mind. We were mapping a city in India, Pune. Google Earth, you can zoom in on things. 
and we saw it from an aerial view and we started to draw it on a huge piece of paper. And, we, and then we did a raise, like five by five, like five buildings up and down. It doesn't have to be like exact, but we just made up like buildings. You know, our teacher drew lines and we did it the coordinates for like where the northwest corner was and where the southwest corner was on the away. And I take ballet classes and I just love, love watching, watching the bigger girls dance. My, my girl teacher, teacher, she's like the founder of the company, and, and she's a teensy bit stricter, but she pushes me, which makes me stronger, and I like, like being pushed. This is where your leg should be, but it's not getting there, so I need you to get there. So folks, I can now make my fifth and final point. We have a gap to bridge, but we can do this and we can do this together. Collaboration improves us exponentially, no matter how smart an individual is. And agriculture is a great example of teamwork of a collaborative society. So is science. Isaac Newton had famously uh, said, if we have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And by the way, we don't know who invented agriculture, but I think it was most certainly a woman. So ladies, it is basically up to us to actively participate in this movement and perhaps even lead the way as we have always done. All the stakeholders in this mission need to come together. We have students, educators, parents, community members who can also be great mentors, funders, public, private, we hope that the funding through Congress will go through, but in the meantime, I'm sure private organizations, especially companies, can put in a lot more than we are seeing right now. And policymakers, this needs to be blessed by policymakers in order to have every student in America learn computer science. As they say, it takes a village to raise a child, especially one that needs to be proficient in computer science. So to summarize my five points, a computer is a lot more than what we think. It can be whatever we imagine. Software is eating the world and will continue to do so. Our children are underprepared for this very digital future. And we need to think of innovative ways to bridge this gap, the hows and the whats of teaching computer science. We can get there, but it will take all of us together to get there. Another video, by the way, if you have been wondering about why we are playing so many videos, there's a story behind that. My older son is in high school and for the last 10 years or so, I've been you know, asking him to tell me about how his day went. And I recall him telling me numerous times that his favorite experiences in learning were whenever the teachers played videos to reinforce learning. So here we are playing videos for all of you. <laughs> So here we are going to get teachers' points of view. We ask some great teachers why they do what they do. Can you please play the fourth video? I love working with kids. Really doing something that really warmed my heart and got me excited about life. Sharing my experiences and sharing what I know about the world with younger children to really bring up that next generation of adults. I saw that it's a better way to contribute to the society. I was getting my master's in counseling and I did some career counseling with adults with special needs as a job coach um, and just fell in love. I wanted to make a difference and I wanted to teach differently, especially languages, um, to make it more approachable and successful. I teach a credit recovery math class for uh, juniors and seniors who need to meet the minimum graduation requirements. I just love those moments of, you know, the light bulb moment when suddenly the kids go, oh, this is what you meant. This is why you had me do this. Um, we have had activities in class that have focused on um, colonizing Mars, for example, and a lot of the ideas that students have are actually ideas that NASA astronauts have come up with that they don't even realize that that's the same idea. The moment when the students, they, they started to ask questions in Mandarin, that was the time that I enjoyed a lot. Juan Carlos, 
who literally just lights up because he realizes he did something he at the beginning of the year he didn't think would be possible and that's graduating from high school. Those kids I would say like the stars in the sky they just uh, shining on you inspire you when things are a little bit difficult and uh, you will remind their smile their smile always remind you of those the good things happening. I realized the kids already know it just intuitively they figured it out it was trial and error the whole idea of it's okay to fail because you're learning and moving on from there. So we saw this amazing video about what inspires teachers, why many of you do what, what you do. And to celebrate your work and excellence in teaching computer science, Infosys Foundation USA is thrilled to announce the Infosys Foundation USA ACM CSTA Computer Science Teachers Awards. There will be 10 awards for $10,000 each. You will soon see the entry details by September from ACM and CSTA, and we hope to announce the winners during CSED week in December. So please stay tuned, please apply, please you know, follow up. And beyond that, we are also looking forward to working with CSTA, so please stay tuned about that as well, some soon to follow good news. I can't share, say anything else about that yet. <laughs> and now I want to play a video, yes, another video, but our last video. This is by a very special person, an active advocate in education, diversity, and most importantly, the CS for All movement our leading lady in tech policy, our very own Chief Technology Officer of the United States, Megan Smith. Hi, I'm Megan Smith. I'm the US Chief Technology Officer, and it's an honor to talk with all of you. Krista McAuliffe used to say, I touch the future, I teach. And there's nothing more true than our computer science and computational thinking teachers who are really touching our future. And the more we can do to include all of our children, uh, across all of our schools and universities, even down to pre-K, the better off this country's going to be and the brighter the future. And you guys are a big part of that. Uh, we have a challenge in the U.S. There's 5.8 million jobs open right now, and the largest sector is the 600,000 jobs that are in these tech fields. They're user interface design, coding, front end, back end, cyber, product management, digital marketing. So all our country companies are starving for these employers. They're all across the country. They're not just in high tech, they're in manufacturing, agriculture, healthcare, all the passion areas that our kids are interested in working on. So how do we get them there? And that's where you guys come in. The president has announced uh, in January uh, of the, earlier this year the Computer Science for All initiative. And it's really an all hands on deck effort. It includes a request and ask from him for $4 billion budget request, including monies into the states and local areas. It's also got already commitments from the National Science Foundation and the Corporation for National and Community Service, $135 million for teacher training and school readiness to support you. Uh, we need so many more of you. So it's really about how do we get all of you in a position to help uh, bring more and more of this uh, skill set to all of your students and help you mentor and support other teachers. We need both the classic set of like coding classes and computational thinking and that kind of computer science class that we have at all the levels, middle school, high school, little bit elementary and into college. We also need it embedded, of course, in algebra, but also we've seen extraordinary teachers. One of my favorites from the computer science education champions of change is a fabulous teacher from Queens, Spanish teacher, who's embedding it into her programs and also created an intensive called digital dance. So the dance can have computer science. We can have art and music. We can have our history projects and timelines. We can start to do really creative work with basic digital uh, literacy work as well as straight into coding and computation. Huge opportunity. The thing I know is that everyone in this room, most of you are already starting to do this. And the more you can cross share what you know with each other, the more, we'll, the faster we're going to move because we already have a lot of the brilliant best practice for teaching project-based 
kids learning, encouraging all the children, checking our bias at the door, things like working on ambient bias. You know, do we have Grace Hopper, Katherine Johnson, Ada Lovelace on our walls together with Bill Gates and Steve Jobs uh, and, and uh, our other colleagues like Turing? Are, they, are we gender balancing, racially balancing, showing our children that everyone's always done this and making sure they know that. I know that you're hearing about the ENIAC story. Uh, we have an ENIAC prize that some colleagues launched to help people with their classroom design. So how do we work together to get all the kids in, in, how do we work on the challenges they face when they watch TV? It's 15 to 1, boy programmers to girl programmers that are cast and animated in children's television. The bias that the Hollywood folks are bringing, they don't mean that, it's just in us. So how do we, how do we work and not have that? So I really encourage you to work together, team up, share the best practices, look at those who have already balanced their classroom, gender balance, you see it in your classroom, and get all the kids involved. We have so many challenges in our world. We have this economic challenge of the jobs, uh, job openings, but we also have extraordinary problems to solve, and we need that data science, computational thinking, creativity, app makers, that these kids will bring on the things that they care the most about, and they have passion for solving in the world. And you, are the path for that. So thank you so much for your service, for your leadership, for everything you do every day in the classrooms for America. And I'm looking forward to how you figure out how to scale this so we can really, really take this to everyone in the country. Thank you. Isn't she awesome? And she's absolutely right. We need to teach computer science to every student in the United States boys, girls, people from underrepresented groups, everybody. The journey has begun. We just need to accelerate our pace. We need to think about new ways of teaching computer science, the what's and the how's. We need to do more, do better, and do it together. So as we wrap up this amazing event organized by CSTA, by the way, before I go on, let's give a shout out to all these awesome organizers who worked tirelessly to put this event together. So now that the event is about to end, how about a goal? How about an audacious goal? We can't leave an event without a goal, right? Every US kindergarten student starting school in fall this year should be computer science proficient by the time they graduate in 13 years. Now imagine a little girl who's starting kindergarten this fall on her first day to school her, holding her parents' hands nervous, excited at the same time. Imagine the same little girl 13 years later. She's now grown up, she's confident. She enjoys playing sports as much as she enjoys learning science and math. She's proficient in the languages and in the arts, but most importantly, she has studied and understands the fundamentals of computer science. She doesn't know if she will be a technologist or not, but she's not afraid of technology and she knows that she has the skills to be a creator, not just a consumer of technology. She doesn't know yet what she wants to be, but she knows that whatever she decides to be, her life is enriched and much better because she has the skills that she needs to be successful in a very digital future. <laughs> Let us take a vow today that we will all work together to make sure that 13 years from now, when this little girl, and for all that matter, every other child is computer science proficient, as proficient as they are in reading, writing, and learning the piano. Ladies and gentlemen, the future is being written in code, code that our children will write, code that your students will write, code that you will teach them how to write, and we thank you for that. On that note, I thank you for your time, for your patience, and for everything else that you do. We wish you safe travels and all the best. Thank you very much. <laughs>